Okay. Great. I will be sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. And I would like to ask uh, the audience to type uh, your questions in the chat or use the raised hand button during the discussions for questions, comments. And I will uh, remind all presenters that uh, you will have three minutes or you will have one minute and it, it will be typed in the chat box. Okay, so you're welcome. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Lagos, for the uh, introduction and welcome everybody. And I hope you're going to enjoy the journey with us. So I'm going to just describe a little bit of background first. Uh, we work for the GMMDC, which is the Governor Becky Mathematics Development Center. And since 2017, we've started incorporating a bit of the um, math art or STEAM into our education system or our education methods. Um, we do this through STEAM workshops with learners, GeoGebra seminars, STEAM activities as part of our teacher programs. And then what I'm going to chat to you about today is the National Math Art Competition. Now, just briefly, the, the different other aspects of the STEAM workshops with learners. We get learners from all groups together and we have workshops with them. Now, this is for before COVID and hopefully now as things are quieting down in the world, we'll be able to do this again. <laughs> We also play around with some tessellations and you can also see some of my other colleagues there and coding games with learners. Then in our GeoGebra seminars and applets, we have a lot of fun with the teachers doing a bit of GeoGebra and some experiential learning with some of the applets that some of my colleagues have designed. We also play around with the teachers and also learn a lot. Um, we, they, we always feel that demonstrating it to the teachers first to excite them and then to carry it over to the learners as well. Since COVID in 2020, um, we couldn't really have workshops with the teachers necessarily um, full on workshops. So what we did was have, we had webinars with the teachers and then we encouraged them to do the activities with some of the learners. Right, but now as to our matter on hand and that's the National Math Art Competition. Now, what is this National Math, sorry, Math Art Competition? It's an annual competition it, that started in 2018. And in the, the focus of the competition is for learners to see maths differently, to inspire creativity and innovation, and then also to inspire artistic connections. They've got to create a 2D artwork and they must describe what they've done in a short paragraph. Before we started, they had to send in their physical entries at the beginning of the competition. But for the past two years, we've been doing it online, which was also such a blessing during COVID. Some of the outcomes of the project that we've received, some of the positive outcomes, um, emphasized the need for a low threshold, non-expensive and equal access STEAM support program. What we realized was that the kids released their creativity and what we also want to do is to motivate them and to bring recognition to all of the teachers and learners, including those from poorer communities and under-resourced schools. This competition also offers an opportunity for networking, just like we're doing today. So we are chatting about the competition, meeting each other, and hopefully later on, you'll be able to give me some feedback on what you think as well. It's also a platform for expression for us, for the learners and for then other people who interact with the competition as well. And then of course, we're promoting STEAM in South Africa. Now, first of all, I said recognition to schools and learners. So we have a prize winning whole ceremony where we invite learners to come and also view the others artworks and then to get recognition. And then we try to also exhibit the artworks in more than one place to also give schools and learners recognition in more than one area. So the competition asks, what do you get when you add maths and art and mix them up to the power of your creativity? And initially, when we started this math art journey, we thought that we'd be getting back artworks and maths and having kids excited about maths, but we actually got much more. We got learners' feelings and emotions about their maths classes and life, about how they feel, which was something which was relatively unexpected to us. We also got learners' feedback about education issues. So learners think about their own education and they want to have a platform in which they express what they're feeling as well. 
the one at the top says the learners with a more creative way of learning struggling class because the way mathematics is being taught is rigid and in the past, which is a bit of a finger pointing a finger to us as teachers and educators in South Africa. The learners also felt in the competition, and although this wasn't the brief, they felt through the competition a need to express current world issues, issues with, for example, in the top left, issues with rhinos in South Africa, uh, energy resources, the nature of being um, uh, not looked after, plastics, which is a great problem, I think, worldwide, and then corruption in all areas of society. We also found that, that learners explored common school maths topics. For example, this learner here said, I used pi, it's unique and it fascinates me. For any circle, it doesn't matter what size, the ratio always equals pi. And now this learner is starting to think about this common thing. This is most fascinating. Why does it always equal pi? And this is one of our, our primary school learners thinking about pi. Why, why is it always pi? Why is that ratio always equal to a certain value? But what also is exciting is that learners are exploring other topics in maths that they're not normally doing at school. So this competition is also stimulating them to explore further topics. However, not always with plain sailing in the competition. Sometimes we've also encountered some challenging situations, and of course, then the pandemic. Initially, the problem was, or the question that we got asked is, how do you combine maths and art? How is this possible? So we started out by doing workshops to try and stimulate people to, to see the connections between maths and art and how to actually do it. And we wanted them to see that creating, even in a maths class, is fun. And of course, we're doing maths too. The second thing that was always challenging and stays challenging is the judging of the artworks. How do you eventually boil it down to a specific winner? So we're actually moving away from one or two or three winners in a category to rewarding excellence. In other words, rewarding all of the artworks that have done well and gained more than a certain amount. We always invite to try and make it as fair as possible, a complete transdisciplinary team, for example, lecturers and teachers and people from the public in art, architecture, mathematics, education, humanities, sciences, all the different faculties. Both the artwork and, of course, that written paragraph that I spoke about is judged. And entries with a high level of creativity in connecting maths and art is rewarded. What is always difficult is to try and educate our judges not to focus on in the paragraphs whether good English, correct English was used, or if you look at the artwork, to note that the artwork, some learners are not necessarily in art school or have any art education, but they might have very creative ideas. So not to look at a beautifully painted technique, correct artwork, but to actually try and discover the creativity in the artwork. So that's a, always a challenging issue. And it is of course important to note that English is not the home language of most of other learners in South Africa that enter our competition as well. But just some of the feedback from our judges. So one of this, this um, judge here said that this artworks, the artwork that expressed math anxiety in a beautiful way was especially surprising and evocative. It was something I did not expect at all. And I was quite moved by these images. It was nice to see how the learners incorporated everyday math into their artworks. And this person remarked that some children used math theories that also caused them to explore it and it was an enriching experience. So even for the judges, this has been an enriching experience. It was a joy and a wonder to see each learner's idea of math expressed artistically. Surprised that so many perceive it so concretely. And that is something that I, that I try to emphasize as well. We should not expect less of our learners, but rather expect more. And then this judgeship is always inspiring. And this is exactly what we as competition organizers have been found. It's been an enriching, inspiring education and journey for us as well. Another problem that we obviously have is learners that copy from the internet. Of course, it's a quick fix, but it's also been a challenge to educate schools and learners 
that this is not okay, and that we actually are looking for something creative and original. Let's take a journey through the different years. First of all, our competition in 2018 was just where we started out. And as I said, we had the physical drawing sent in and we asked them to have any application of maths and art. And this is a selection of what we received. So if you can have a look, very broad general scope of learners drawing all different varieties of what they perceive as maths, maths in their hobbies, maths in graphs, maths in shapes, maths in where they live. And the top left one, that one was actually linked to a poem that the learner wrote about how he has, um, or some people perceive themselves as being an error, like in maths you find an error, and a whole beautiful poem about that. Here are some more artworks, lovely artworks, some of them colorful. In 2019, we chose a new theme and we narrowed it down to maths in nature and maths in man-made design. And the four questions that the learner had to ask, answer, what maths did you see? How did your drawing link to the category? What makes your artwork unique and special? And here is some of the artworks in the man-made category. So the first category was man-made. And if you have a look over here, a great variety of man-made in cultural drawings, man-made in um, different designs, uh, and also in, in technology and in dances and movement. Here is another example of some of the man-made designs. Here and also another surprising man-made designs. And then maths in nature, where learners had a look at what and where in nature we could find mathematics. These are just a few examples of what we received that year. And then in 2020, which was the year of, the, of COVID and pandemic in South Africa. And our competition started just before COVID started. And then we moved into an absolute lockdown in South Africa. And uh, the learners, we were quite surprised. We, we were concerned whether the competition would really get entries. We were concerned about what learners would be entering in. And our theme for this year was my universe. And we actually expected quite a lot of them to be about COVID, but not that as many as we thought. This year, the competition was for the first time completely online, judging took place online, and learners could enter online, which was actually a saving grace for this competition because it awarded the learners an opportunity and a chance to be able to still enter into the competition, although everybody was locked down at home. Let's have a look at a selection of these artworks. Now, when we threw out the theme, My Universe, we of course thought as well initially that learners will come up with the most common My Universe looking into space. And we did get some of those artworks as well. So yes, we did get some artworks where learners described space or aeronautics or something like that. But then we also got a lot of other themes where learners saw as their universe, my body, my muscles and, and sport and what I'm taking part in, looking at built environments, the universe in the maths class, where they were sitting together with other learners in a maths class, and that was their maths universe, and just looking at things differently, staring into space. And then, of course, a lot of learners, and this is a recurring theme actually every year, I suppose it's being teenagers entering into the competition, their bodies are very important to them. So a lot of learners expressed their universe as their body and what they perceived as how other people saw, saw their bodies and what they thought about each other. So this is also a very interesting outcome or part of the journey. It's always interesting to us to follow how, what our teenagers are thinking. A lot of teenagers expressed their universe in their hobbies, in technology, in what they were doing in the room, and always interesting to see. Here are another selection of the beautiful artworks that we received from different learners. The one at the top bottom expressing the universe inside her head. So what is she thinking? That's her universe. Um, one of the, the round one in the middle was actually a beautiful string art picture where the learner used 
computer simulate or computer program algorithms to design to to uh, portray her herself it's a self portrait of herself and this was almost a family project during lockdown which was so exciting that kids had something positive and stimulating to do through the lockdown as well here are a few more of the beautiful and varied topics that the learners sent artworks into our 2021 competition last year we thought well wow, we're through the pandemic and we're going to now have a look at something beautiful, beautiful mathematics. Once again, however, we were doing all the entries online, which was great because even though we weren't in hard lockdown, there were still a lot of challenges in the different schools. Our judging also took place online. Let's have a look at a selection of these artworks. We also, or one of the artworks that gained a lot of of interest was this one here where the learner said, the beauty of mathematics is when I'm happy when I get to the answer. Drawing a beautiful picture is like working out a mathematical sum. And then she went to describe and how mathematics and doing this artwork and mathematics was actually something beautiful that could happen amidst a lot of stress and COVID and pandemic and uncertainty. This learner here said, the dress that this woman wearing in this artwork is similar to the dress my grandmother constructed when I was little. It stood out amongst the other things because she made, um, the, of things she made because of the shapes and bright colors used in it. Looking back, I've realized you have to have a good understanding of maths to make a dress like that. So learners are now linking up their culture, their background, and common day objects like dresses and seeing the maths in it, and also acknowledging that people in an informal way are using maths even if they don't know it. So it's all about looking or finding a new perspective. On the right, the picture is a new perspective towards technology, this steampunk picture of technology. In the middle, a new way of looking at iconic structures in the world, not just seeing the beautiful structure, but also seeing the maths and all of the beautiful shapes inside it. Also looking at a common object such as a Rubik's cube and having a completely different look at creating a new planet of it and a planet maths, beautiful maths in it. Something that was also quite interesting in this year, and maybe it's something that we need more of in this world, was some of the learners seeing a little bit of humor and cartoons. Um, the one on the left showing a popular cartoon figure, and then the one on the right, which was just actually a bit of a play on words. So I ate some pie and it was delicious. Very good, then, very good. Sorry, just one moment. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, you have one more minute, but we have to stick to the schedule. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Lajos. I'm almost finished. Um, just a few last few things here is captivated, shattered figures, and then the mass monster on the inside with the symbols. Uh, once again, always about perceiving themselves and images, beautiful figures, and then also divine corporality. I'm going to finish off with this last one. I used a simple, well-known rule of mathematics. Anything divided by zero is undefined. The numerator's numerical value can be whatever you want it to be. I find it beautiful that in an artwork, this allows you to be free and to express yourself artistically without borders or barriers or guidelines. Wonderful way that learners express even a simple little mathematical cray or rule that we know as dividing by undefined. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to take you through this journey with mathematics. And thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, I don't know whether there has there are any questions? I don't even know if we have any time. Karin, thank you for this wonderful presentation and congratulations for promoting STEAM education in South Africa. And I'm glad that you pointed out that math is taught rigid based on obsolete traditions and this has to be changed. And I also liked uh, the way that you emphasize that uh, judging of artworks uh, by an transdisciplinary three team is very important and i love this idea okay uh, uh does anyone have a question uh if you haven't uh formed your question yet you can uh send it 
after the presentation as well. So, uh, anyone? Question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so I have a, uh, one question. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation, Karin. Um, I really love the activities, the project. Um, I also always interest. I'm also always interested in um, implementing mathematics and art, especially in mathematics classroom for students. Um, uh, my question is. Um, in my in my experience when i uh, was implementing art in the classroom i was losing the mathematics content so uh, could you please uh, give me suggestion how to tackle with the issue thank you very much <laughs> it's, it's always very difficult and and not i think all i think this is is the the absolute creativity and innovation that comes in to be able to to visually or show and demonstrate artistically a lot of the mathematical concepts. Um, if I can refer back to that final one, um, maybe I could just quickly show that final sketch again. Um, if one looks, for example, at something like uh, the rule of is something divided by zero is undefined. If you have a look at this, just this picture here, this picture shows something, a well-defined picture, and then something quite liquid and fluid at the bottom, undefined, zero. So um, I think it's not so easy to demonstrate mathematical concepts in a classroom. And it might be, you know, depending on what your focus is in class, you, you can't necessarily have everything surrounding art. But to challenge the learners, to take something like a simple rule, or a, a geometrical theorem and to go and make a picture and then to put, put it up in school in such a way, promote the theorem, help them to remember the theorems is something that one can do. But I do agree. Um, yes, it's not, it, one, one needs to, to have certain focus or a certain um, rule. And then and in class, one still has to get down to business and finish what you need to do, but also to encourage them to think differently about things. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so the next presenter is, uh, I try to pronounce it well, Dewa Gede Parta Farida Nurhashna. And the title of the presentation is Painting Sierspinski Using GeoGebra. Sounds interesting. So Dewa, are you ready? Can you hear me? Farida, you are still muted. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you hear my voice right now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so, it's okay. like um, Mr. Dewa still uh, has a problem or because I couldn't see him. But actually, um, today I would like to present um, his uh, work, his artworks. So uh, may I... Uh, share my presentations. Yeah. Okay. Um. Hello, me. everyone. Hi. Everyone is. Uh, everything is all right. Everything is all right. Deva has just started sh sharing the screen. Okay. Excellent. And uh, just to make sure, uh, and I just wanted to say to the session chair that when you finish your presentation, please upload your presentation to the Google Drive folder that I shared. Okay. okay. So, so yeah. now I do the recording in one uh, file. Is it okay? Or do yeah, I have but... to? Okay. No, no, uh, just keep the recording running, so. Okay, okay, I keep it running. Thank you. Okay, I will, I will, uh, I will upload these files, these presentation slides into the Google Drive after this. Um, hello everyone, good afternoon from Indonesia. Uh, here, I am Farida Nurhasana. Actually today, uh, I'm supposed to um, present this uh, part with Mr. Dewa Gedeparta, 
Um, I can say that Mr. Dewa is one of the mathematicians artists from Indonesia, and then he has a very unique um, artworks, mathematic artworks that was um, we we are I mean I and Dewa would like to present in this event. Unfortunately, on behalf of Mr. Dewa, it seems like he has uh, troubles, so he couldn't. Uh, join with us today, but I hope that uh, through these presentations, uh, we can uh, we can enjoy his artwork together here. Um, before I start to uh, present, I'm sorry that uh, we just uh, agree that uh, the title of the presentation we uh, changed, so it's become the sub similar title in painting using GeoGebra. Um, I think before we talk about the artworks, then we need to know who is Mr. Dewa. Um, Mr. Dewa, we can say from Indonesian perspective that his name represents a very familiar place in Indonesia. This name is specifically for Balinese people. So, Dewa Gedeparta, it is very specific then from the name we can know that he came from Bali. Actually, he is a mathematician and um, right now he lives in Bandung city, in Cimahi city. And something very interesting about his work is that he used GeoGebra for painting and mixing color using uh, these applications. And um, before I present this, I give a long conversation with him, try to interview about uh, what his ideas and then how he did it. And actually, I met with Dewa in the year of 2020. Uh, the first time I still remember, he contacted me through the Facebook Messenger and he introduced um, about himself to me. And since then, we um, had several discussions. Out of sudden, when I, when I had um, a holiday session in my, in, in, in my villa home in Bandung, then he come to my home and then um, he uh, share his knowledge and his experience uh, using GeoGebra. It was a very wonderful experience to know him personally. Um, actually, he developed the method that he called as one-time debrat. Debrat, it means um, Indonesian slang words, or in English, we can say it's one-time executions for presenting mathematic concept in uh, simple algorithms. Uh, but it result in the um, geometrical representations. He used to work in Microsoft Excel. He used to work in Microsoft Excel uh, to develop the one-time debris. I can say that one-time debris or one-time executions uh, algorithm. So long before he knew about GeoGebra, he, ha he has been working a lot with the um, algorithm in uh, Microsoft Excel. But then um, he got stroke for quite a long time. Um, luckily, after um, he helped again, after he, he got his help, then he started to uh, know about GeoGebra. And then after that, um, we learned how to, uh, how to uh, use GeoGebra or help him in order to um, cure some of the part of his brain, which was um hit by the stroke so that's the story was beginning uh this is very interesting and day by day by exercising 
how to use um, is part of the brains using algebra and then to think mathematically. Uh, he finds some of the other function of his body getting better and better. This is really, really an interesting uh, story. Um, and then after that, he continued to try to learn and then reading mathematics book. Um, all the words that I will present today, we will present today, was inspired by the dissertations of Ellen Peter James with the title um, Complex Dimension of Subsimilar Systems. So he told that all his works come from the chapter three in these dissertations. Before he retired, he used to be a lecturer in one of the government polytechnic in Bandung, Bandung Polytechnic. And then he retired in the year of 2018 after um, he got the strokes of that. And here, um, the method that I used to uh, learn about his work actually I download all his uh, artworks in Facebook, as well as all the artwork that he sent to me directly. So it's a, a huge number uh, of artworks here. Then I call this, a, it's a kind of a painting, digital painting using GeoGebra. And then I try to uh, classify all those work into several groups. And then here I would like to share the results to all of you here. Mostly it comes from the Sierpinski. He told me that everything starts from the Sierpinski uh, gasket. So from, from this Sierpinski gasket, then he tried to develop into another um, forms and also uh, playing with colors here, so not only with the shapes itself. And then he moved to um, the panther gasket also here. So some of his art, it can be said that mostly about self-similar tiling, for example, using this. But what I really um, mean is about how he could um, playing with the colors in GeoGebra. I think this is really, really interesting, but unfortunately, um, our conversation has not come to this part. So if you're asking about uh, how probably the color can show up here, I'm sorry, uh, here we have um, Azan. So should I continue or do you feel this? We can hear you. We can hear you. It's okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So I can continue. So something very interesting is about how they, how uh, he can come up with a very colorful, um, uh, a very, a variative colors, which is um, sometimes soft and then sometimes very sharp uh, that uh, that she has. But when I try to uh, classify his artworks mostly about he, even though he's, he said to me that something very interesting is like this one. Um, actually, the pedagogical um, background uh, or views from him is like that. He told me that actually, um, GeoGebra is my friend. <laughs> he told me like that. And then um, it helps him in order to do a kind of dialogue with the GeoGebra. So whenever he um, he did a kind of uh, art constructions, or probably I can say about uh, the digi digi digital painting, it's like the dialogue with the GeoGebra itself. He told me about that, and he tried to teach me about this. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to 
uh, grabs this idea yet. So uh, I still cannot share the story today with all of you. This is um, some of the examples about the Pentagon sketch that uh, he created in the different colors, even though it's the uh, a little bit similar here. And then he also used uh, star representations. Uh, I can see that uh, a lot of stars um, classifications and, and representation about the stars and all the modification here um, from the basic representation of stars and then very stunning the compositions of the colors and also um, the structure here how the cells are trailing itself um, it's really really amazing and this is uh, two different colors also we found and this in this right it seems like inspired by one of the um, cultural um, building in Bali. It was a pure, pure, but it's made from uh, the star the structures made from the stars. And another thing is about cortex here. I also found uh, in the the painting that the um, the pattern of the Lisa is required as a vortex, the vortex, like this one. So he has um, a lot of variations about these shapes, and like this one also, um, these two um, paintings with the the difference between the colors, the compositions of the colors, we can see uh, um, it's really original. I mean, really his style. He has very uh, specific styles of the um, colors, okay, of the colors. And um, another thing also that very interesting is about the use of the circles. So uh, besides, um, the stars he used a lot of circles and then mostly he told me uh, when he constructed the circle he used the um he used the imaginary numbers the imaginary numbers and and then um uh to construct all the circles in his painting he also uh, inspired uh, uh inspired by the um, golden ratio and some of the painting he told uh, me that it's about the golden ratio also um, beside the imaginary numbers and the complex numbers and some patterns or some paintings looks like a flower so uh, we try to classify into the flowers here and then it's very beautiful, yeah. The representation of the paintings. And this is the examples about uh, how he first started uh, the Pentagon Sirskinski Kissing Circle. And from the process that he told me about uh, how he used GeoGebra to help him learning, mostly, um, teacher, especially from education background, they will use GeoGebra for helping students learning mathematics. But he told me at the first time, what he did is about, he tried to use mathematics in order for learning GeoGebra. And then uh, it's not only uh, for the GeoGebra, but mostly he learns about technology using mathematics. This is something really, really different with most of the mathematic educators, in my opinion. Uh, and it is very interesting. And I think um, uh, it's very, it has potential to do a kind of research about how actually we use uh, mathematics for learning technology. And it become one of the interesting topics that uh, uh, we discussed together about this. And 
um, how the process of learning itself. I mean, uh, because he has the strong background in mathematics, but different with the, uh, for example, the students in the classroom who uh, on the other side, sometimes teachers and also the educators um, use the tools or the technology to help them in order to understand the mathematical concept or to construct the mathematic concepts. I think this is something really need to uh, do a kind of a more study about his um, about his views about related to how we can use mathematics for learning um, technology or for learning software, something like that. And then the other things that he really consistent as um, individuals um, for presenting his uh, art, mathematic arts using Facebook. Mostly uh, he always present all his um, painting uh, through the people that he wanted directly to uh, show his painting. So um, first of all, he just choose uh, some specific persons in the uh, Facebook, for example, just like uh, Professor Zod, I think uh, he contacted directly first, and then after that, uh, he tried to introduce his um, painting. And then he also now uh, involved in some of the groups of STEAM so that um, more people from around the world can recognize his. Uh, mathematic arts and also uh, if, for example, we would like to know more about uh, how this mathematic arts uh, produce or creates by him, then uh, we can we we uh, we can contact him directly using the Facebook platform. Okay, so I think. Uh, that's what I can say about um, the arts of uh, Mr. Dewa. And so um, I think now we can have more discussions uh, related to the arts of hymns and also probably the structure and also the, the relationship with the algebra itself. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing artworks from an amazing person, Farida. Thank you for telling this story and presenting these beautiful geometric artworks. Artworks, I especially like the vortex one. Uh, so I would like to remind all participants that you can either ask questions directly through your microphone or type it into the chat box. And you can also use the raise hand icon if you want to chime in. So does anyone have questions? I have some comments. Okay. So Dean, this, this is really amazing. So uh, I have been following uh, Deva's work and then he has hundreds or thousands of, uh, of in this work. So I think it's, uh, it's very important to show to the world that uh, how it is. But I think when, what we need to, to do is that talking more with Deva that how he gets his inspiration and then also just connecting with uh, with the mathematics behind this, and uh, and I think then this is um, this is really great. And then what we what we really would like to do is uh, is uh, creating a, a kind of online exhibition with him. And then also um, it's not public yet, but uh, uh, Mara will announce in the afternoon that we will have a special issue in the mathematics and the arts journal. So I would really encourage you to write a paper with uh, with Deva, and then maybe we can do something together, and maybe Christoph. And uh, so I think this is really great. And then same with um, with Karin and um, and Werner. Then we we would be very happy to to join. So we are planning this conference more in uh, 
in presence and uh, I think there will be lots of opportunities to to do this and then we need to have in these connections with these amazing mathematicians and artists and then it will bring forward a uh, lot of things so I think you are very lucky in Indonesia to have uh, such a person and and I think uh, giving room for him is, uh, is is really great so thank you very much for the presentation and um, Thank you. And it will be nice. And thanks, Lajos, for leading the session. You're welcome. Any questions? You can also send your questions uh, directly to the presenter after the meeting, but you can do it now. OK, so uh, the next presenter is Tong Kem Lam, and the topic is folded paper corrugation. Okay, Tang, are you ready? Okay, I can see you. And um, for the, just the presentation, don't forget to upload the, the files to the thing. So Lajos, if you can remind uh, okay. speakers uh, af afterwards, so then that is good. I, I post the, the link again. Okay, yeah. okay, I can remind them. So Tang, are you ready to start? I think your microphone is muted now. I think you're click. So uh, please say something just to make sure that your voice is okay. Okay, good morning. Okay. Thank you, okay. thank you. Okay, um, so um, what, what I was here to present was some simple, uh, well, not so simple, perhaps, um, what's known as origami tessellations or corrugations and um, how to simulate them in dynamic geometry software like GeoGebra. Um, so um, let's start from the top. So for those who don't know, origami is the Japanese word for paper folding, and it's become um, quite a, uh, a topic for research, for mathematicians, scientists, and engineers. It's also become quite an artistic field as well. Um, so the particular type of folding we're looking at today is using uh, paper and putting creases in them. And typically what you do is you collapse the paper uh, after creasing um, to, make, to make a shape. And this sort of work, <laughs> Um, uh, was pioneered by several people, um, including uh, Shuzo Fujimoto from Japan, David Hoffman, the famous computer scientist, and Von Resch, uh, an American artist, engineer, mathematician, scientist, and other people. Um, but it doesn't have to be this complex. Uh, you can also use very simple um, paper folding for, for geometry, obviously, uh, but other topics in mathematics like uh, fractions and proof, problem solving, and so on. Um, so um, I posted this on social media um, a, a couple of months ago, and um, I made a couple of these sorts of um, uh, simulations. And this one proved to be more popular than the one was actually harder to do, which is often the case. Sometimes the simple things are more appealing than the more complex things. Um, and if possible, maybe, if people are interested, we could actually have go a folding a simple version of this maybe later if people have a piece of paper with them. So maybe um, a piece of A5 paper or a square of, um, or a square of memo paper. So perhaps something like, um, something like that, a piece of paper like that, or something a little larger maybe. We'll see how time goes. So there's, there's several techniques used for simulating origami. Obviously, if we consider the paper to be rigid, when you fold the paper, um, when you fold the paper, you're rotating uh, a polygon about a line. So straight away, you got an office application to GeoGebra. Um, 
you also can buy set angles and so on. So all your classic constructions uh, you can use. Um, so the structure of the paper is what um, origami could call a crease pattern. So once you unfold a paper, you mark the um, crease is either valley fold, so that's a concave fold in blue, or if you turn it over, a convex fold, that's a mountain fold, and that's in red. So what you would do for this um, construction is you would crease the paper, but this is actually quite a bit simpler. So for this one, you could um, crease into quarters in one direction. And then half oh, other way. And then you would just put the creases on in this section here through. So for my piece of paper, it would be this section here. It'd have two diagonals. And then you would add these angle bisectors in. And then you would open it up and then you'd have to collapse the paper, which perhaps we can do later. Um, so as I said earlier, I did upload some more complicated constructions. And of course, the great thing about uh, GeoGebra and other sorts of environments like Logo and so on is you can start with something simple and then uh, with a few changes, you can get something that looks quite complicated, even though really it's, it's, all, it's all based on the same ideas. Um, so this is what's known as the Waterborne one corrugation. Um, Here's one I folded from a uh, watercolour paper, quite a large sheet, and it, it comes much smaller. And it's very flexible, and organic. Um, but the computer simulation that I've used here obviously doesn't, doesn't curve in the same way. Um, and I think this has become quite an interesting shape that people have used. Um, I believe someone's tried to create a origami stent for use in surgery that opens up to unblock a vessel. Um, and that'll be uses like that. Um, so although this sort of work sort of happened after the, the Second World War, it does have some precedence in earlier work. So for example, um, if you look at um, the use of smocking. Um, this was before the time of elasticated clothing and so on. So this is one way of shaping clothing. And if you look at these patterns here, um, some of these have been created or used well before um, paper folders got interested in them. So um, Adrian Sack Sack had uh, investigated some of these earlier patterns, and she's still using them. In, working with them in materials today. Um, another source of earlier work that's still being used is fabric pleating. So this is a company in England that does bespoke work. And what they do is they use uh, templates and they sandwich the cloth between templates crease it up, process it, and then use it for uh, bespoke clothing that you see in the pictures. So some of these patterns are very familiar to paper folders, but these were used a long time before paper folders became uh, interested in them. Um, it also has uh, scientific uses, corrugations, tessellations. So if you just search for things to do with space telescopes and solar panels and so on, you'll find a lot of research using them to try to create structures that are simple to deploy. So they're packed tight, sent into space and then open up. Um, so for these sort of applications, you can see a lot of research. Uh, for more commercial applications on, on our home planet, um, they tend to be sort of custom work. Um, I think part of the challenge is it's making things that be, can become feasible to be manufactured on a commercial scale. So often these are ideas that 
just just reach a prototype stage. Occasionally, you'll find real buildings and so on using these, but not very often. So as I said, um, simpler folds you can use for uh, learning mathematics. Um, so as it talks about, um, you can use obviously geometry, the vocabulary of geometry. Uh, I think part of the challenge of teaching mathematics is it's quite abstract. So I think using something practical can reinforce the learning, make it more meaningful, and I think more motivating because um, you know, most, most learners enjoy something practical and um, have something that's um, they can hold in their hands and, and show other people. Um, so uh, I wrote a book with Sue Pope on some of the ideas you could use for learning mathematics. Um, also recently I published a book which contains a bit more geometry using different sized rectangles uh, and also some uh, simpler, more complicated shapes that change that work when you change them. Uh, so the other one I wanted to show you was the, uh, the classic, what's known as the Muria map fold. So this again, as I say, is being used in research. So the idea is that um, once you've got your shape, if you just pull on these two corners, it opens. Like that. And uh, that that's way back in the 1970s that, that Muria worked on this. And it's become quite a growing field again, because the idea is that you can just use one axis, one degree of freedom to deploy. And again, the, slight, the challenge with this is, is, is sort of feasible commercial manufacturing that doesn't involve um, handwork. Um, and I think perhaps slightly simpler but related is, is well known is, is the hyperbolic paraboloid, which you can see is a series of concentric squares that have increased on the square and you automate mountain and valley and so on. So obviously the more divisions you have, the finer the results. We'll just to give you a taste of the idea of using origami and GeoGebra for learning mathematics. Uh, that's really well to show. And if, if there's time or people want to, they could have a go at making uh, perhaps the corrugation that was shown at the beginning. So that's the end of my presentation. And say, so if there's people want to, I can show how to make uh, the simpler version. So, Excellent. Thank you, Tang. It's a really exciting idea to simulate paper folding through animation, and I'm glad that it is established in GeoGebra platform. And it's also very good that you could present paper folds through your webcam. Really exciting. Thank you for your presentation. And please don't forget to upload your presentation slides to the drive. Okay, any questions? Just feel free. We have plenty of time. Do. <laughs> if there's anything you want to know, I say you could have a go at folding this, or I can show you some simpler folds perhaps, just you know, give an idea. Or I could talk through how to uh, how how this was simulated. Okay, uh, I have a question. Um, it may sound a little bit silly, but does the quality of the paper matter? Because, um, uh, you you presented a very uh, flexible uh, way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. So can it be done with uh, conventional? Uh, writing paper like yes that. yes so so um uh ordinary printer copy paper mm -hmm. is fine so um typically 80 grams per square meter that, that's fine i often use it and part of the benefit mm -hmm. is typically it's, it's the same color both sides mm -hmm. so yes definitely you can use that 
um, as I say, I also use memo cube paper. So, you know, typically, you know, the, the stuff that comes in boxes or um, square yeah. usually. That's uh, can, can you please show the, uh, the previous one? So I, I'm uh, curious about how long does it take to do that for, uh, let's say, an elementary school children like grade four or... Um, well, with, with this one, um, it, this is quite quite a challenging one. This probably took um, a few hours to make because you have to crease it first and then collapse it. But um, simpler one, perhaps you could use, to say, a smaller grid. So you can see it, it, it's the same shape that's repeated. Um, show you this one. Oh. So you can see it's the same cross shape in a square in a row and then the next yes, row grid. half a unit across. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can see there's a cross in a square and the next row up it's shifted on by half a square. So that's, that's possible to make. It, 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 it requires a good deal of accuracy and usually sharp creasing. So grade grade four, um, that's what about year grade four. About, mm -hmm. about nine, ten year old. So perhaps possibly the you know the ones who are quite skilled. But I think the good thing about origami is is, is that uh, unlike a lot of work in school, it's it's kind of self self checking because often you'll hear children say, you know, is this right? Is this right? And with this sort of work, they'll know, oh, mm -hmm. it doesn't look as good as I want it to be. So, so they kind of recognize that they need to make it more accurate or use sharp creases or, or something needs to improve. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the benefits of this, I say. And it's usually a, um, an appealing activity. Um, it doesn't just have to be in sort of special end of term activities or clubs, you know, it can be built into uh, ordinary classwork, you know. So uh, is that a kind of extracurricular activity in your school or can it be integrated into a math class, for instance, I, I've seen it in both. So, so when I when I used to teach, I, I used it in ordinary lessons. You know, it it it, it was usually quite well received. Um, but typically, in my experience, teachers often use it as a enrichment activity. But it doesn't have to be. It can certainly be built into less ordinary lessons. You know, it 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 doesn't require scissors or knives or paint or anything like that. Just paper and hands. So from a safety point of view, you know, it, it, in some ways it's easier than making polyhedra from card and cutting it out, which is, you know, probably one of the few activities that you do see in schools, you know, making oh. card cards models. I just asked the question because uh, I have experience in Hungary and uh, Hungarian education system is, is quite rigid and it is very, very hard to integrate some extra things into a uh, regular uh, math class because there are plenty of things to teach and so it's it most of the time they are extracurricular activities these kind of things yes yes as, as i say i so part part of the reason we uh, sue and i wrote the book was to try and show teachers that you know it, it can be used to teach very mainstream topics like fractions you know so for example you know if, if i crease my square or rectangle oblong into a four by four grid you know you can do quite a lot of fraction work you know so you can show that three quarters of the square is that half the square is that so half of three quarters what's that it's a fraction and you can count and count the squares you can simplify the fraction and so on so it can be used in mainstream lessons definitely it's it's i think as you say that there's there's a perception that, that the fun stuff or what appears to be fun stuff has to be extracurricular but you know, I, I certainly know some teachers who use it in mainstream lessons. Uh, so uh, Mike Holliton in England certainly is a proponent for using origami and other practical methods for teaching mathematics. Beautiful. Thank you. So uh, any questions? You can type it into the chat box if you want. Okay, I see a comment. Lovely ideas. We always find that origami is a great way. Okay. 
May I uh, ask something? Um, mm -hmm. I, I really like this idea, but uh, I can't really imagine how you managed to fold a part without disturbing and destroying anything you folded because you have these uh, little square blocks. Mm -hmm. I do understand that you can fold one part, but how do you manage not to destroy uh, your previous work when you carry on folding? Uh, so if I, if I get a, a different colored piece of paper, so for example, if I have this blue one here, um, so, for example, to make the um, so to, to make this one, I've as I say, I've, I've I've used a path this pattern. So, so what I've done is I've created this the strip, and then I've put these creases on the diagonals and the angle bisectors on. So, so you have to do it. It depends on 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 the work, but for example, for this one, you can do it in the stages. So, if I make my reverse folds here. I can then open the paper and then collapse. Like so, so, so what I'm doing is I'm doing a row at a time. So the next stage is to if I want to make it a bit simple for myself, I can then reverse those set of creases. So because I'm working a row at a time, it, it doesn't interfere with, with what I've done before. But you're right, for some, you, you, you sort of have to do it all at once, which is quite difficult. Um, I'm not sure if I've got an example, maybe I have. For this one, for example, you, you, you sort of have to shape each bit, squeeze it, and then it kind of eventually collapses. So this, this is a pattern by David Huffman, he calls um, arches. You can see it's actually similar to to this one, but it's curved. Um, this one is easier to make because again, you, you can do it in rows. It's a little bit harder. Um, I can think I've got some instructions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, so yeah, so so for that one, you can you can see it, you do it in rows. So so it depends on which one which pattern you're making. Thank you very much really interesting and and i hope that uh we in in other countries can <clears throat> integrate these kind of activities into our curricula okay uh thank you so uh i think the next presenter will be me <laughs> um so uh i share my screen sorry i have to change the whole setup now We'll stop. Okay. Can you please uh, close your uh, share uh, share screen? Okay. Thank you. So uh, my name is Lajos Sebastian Sabo. Uh, I'm from Hungary, and I'm an audio programmer and an education researcher and a multimedia artist. And what I do now is uh, develop a musical application that is not a music composing software. It's, it helps students to understand um, some mathematical principles by using uh, the activity of composing music. And <clears throat> the very essence of this project is that uh, students do not require a preliminary education on music theory or anything else. So it, it can be done by, by uh, full beginners. There's no need to have music theory uh, knowledge or something like that. Okay, let's start with uh, the basics of music and mathematics. How can they connect it? So 
it's a strong relationship and and the story of connecting music and mathematics can be traced back to Pythagoras. He was the first uh, to discover that there are very strong connections between the two. And basically Pythagoras uh, founded the theoretical system uh, that was the basis of Western music theory. And I think not just Western, all the music theory systems in the world. Uh, and the next person who used mathematics for music was Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who created a very interesting uh, dice game, um, which is based on random, uh, random algorithms and random uh, melody creation. And it, it became extremely widespread during the uh, 20th century. And these are the four forerunners of uh, algorithmic music, Arnold Schoenberg, Anton Webern, and John Cage. They use different kinds of mathematical sets to compose music. Uh, and now technology makes possible to present it to anyone who has computers. And it, as I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily require uh, extensive knowledge on music theory. Okay, um, involving arts in science is, science education is a hot topic today, especially since digital technology has replaced old and expensive equipment, which was usually quite difficult to include in a classroom. There are many ways of connecting arts with science. For instance, we can involve geometric art in mathematics class or algorithmic music in an IT class. But first, we should define what we mean by art. Is it art in itself if someone represents numbers with polygons? Is it art in itself if I visually display the bass frequency of a musical tone? I would say, but it's my personal, uh, it's, uh, personal opinion, I would say no, we need something else too. So uh, have a look at this instrument. Uh, it is a polyphonic synthesizer. Um, I think I, I have to share the sound as well. Sorry, share sound. Okay, I have to check it. Can you hear the sound? Okay. Yes. So it's a polyphonic synthesizer. Uh, no matter if you're absolutely inexpert in music, there's something that you can immediately realize by exploring this app. We can change things the way we like it. We can drag the slider to the left or to the right, and we can immediately hear what happened. Okay, so this is the moment when we feel, we usually feel an urge to create something out of nothing. At this moment, we are having an aim, which is to bring something into existence. Maybe something that reflects the world around us through our filters, or just simply something that's our own. There's no human being in the world who haven't felt it yet because it belongs to our nature. We always want to create things. So, and with this firm intention, I finally begin to change things. So what happens if I do that? I do that, I have no idea what I'm doing now. I'm just experimenting and check the sound. Okay, I put it here. Just zoom out a little bit. And let's see how it's on. Okay, it's not that bad, but uh, let's be honest, it, it doesn't sound like a musical piece. And the main feature of this thing is that now at this moment, I don't have any kind of logic behind composing music. I'm just experimenting and see that number is changing and sound is changing. So uh, what if I use uh, some kind of logic, let's say 100 Hertz, let's say 150 Hertz and and I can set it to 200 Hertz. So now I have a fixed amount of addition 
Zero returns. So let's say what happens if I have uh, this really symmetrical thing. So it sounds much better. So you can discover harmonies now. So this is an exact relationship between numbers and, and musical frequencies. So this is the connection between acoustics and music. And the connection is, of course, mathematics. And you can see visually uh, that there is a uh, regular increment now. It's a, it's a kind of uh, linear, linear uh, increment. So what if I set an exponential growth? So let's start with a lower number. Maybe 160 will be. Okay. What you can hear now is an octave scale. And you can, you can see that uh, the exponential growth uh, uh, creates the octaves in music, which is a very important thing in music theory. Linear scale is the overtone system and the exponential scale is the octave system. And uh, what is very important is that it's a creative software. So uh, students can experiment with changing, for instance, uh, the waveform of the sound. So it's a much more sharp sound because I changed it to so too, and I can apply a vibrato. So it's not about mathematics. It's about creating music and experimenting. I can do a lot of things. I can, I can set a kind of echo, uh, let's say this. Or I can put a kind of reverberation that to be a more fat sound. So this is the first step to start using mathematics with music. You start from scratches, you have no idea what you're doing, but then you can apply some kind of increment, regular increment or decrement, and you can, you can uh, be, discover uh, the harmonics in music. So the next step is about musical intervals. It's a really interesting topic. Um, musical intervals are nothing but numerical ratios, or in other words, fractions. So there are uh, several teaching methods, of course, for, for teaching fractions. For instance, you can give a lecture using the chalk and the board, only writing up dozens of formulas. But in this case, uh, don't expect students to be super motivated because the numbers you present them are not connected to real things. In addition, there are no creative tasks involved in a classroom. So how can we connect these numbers with the real world? There are many ways to do that. I'm gonna show you a very simple example of expressing mathematical principles uh, of uh, fractions in music. So look at this uh, thing. It's another polyphonic synthesizer and you can see numerical ratios. Uh, two to one, three to two, four to three, and it is expressed in Hertz. So one, can be uh, 52 hertz and two can be 104. And this is the octave. Let's see the first one, uh, three to two. So if I complete it, uh, by the way, it's, it's a very good uh, platform to practice mental arithmetic and mental math for students, which is, I think, very important. So let's say 100 and uh, 56. Yes, this is a perfect fifth interval. Okay. Let's see another one. Uh, it's uh, okay, three. I can divide it. Okay. Just a moment. Uh, I'm testing my mental math skills now. 
Okay, let's see. Okay. Oh, you're typing the wrong number. Sorry. Uh, okay, so what did I uh, miscalculate now? So I'm on behalf. Let's see this one. No, it's still missing. Okay. Oh, I, I see it. I see it. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. I can do it. So as you can see, it's a good uh, mental math practice, even for adults, <laughs> as, as my experience showed at you. So you can discover uh, musical intervals and harmonies through fractions, which are uh, uh, numerical ratios. Okay, the next one is a rhythm generator. Uh, musical rhythms are another very interesting uh, thing uh, applied in mathematics. Okay, just a moment. Okay, so uh, this one helps to understand rhythmic patterns through the practice of adding simple one digit numbers. Okay, so if you have a look at this uh, page, you can see four empty text boxes and the constant number, which is 16. Um, there's only one instruction saying, choose numbers between one and seven. And if you type numbers out of range, there's an alert, let's see. I type it, or uh, 78 is out of range. So these instructions helps students to choose the proper number. Okay, I have to complete this very simple equation. Let's say four, and uh, there's another instruction. The sum of your numbers has to be 16. Four and five, and let's say two, and I need another one. Ah, okay, I can do it well. So now you can hear a musical uh, rhythmic pattern uh, based on asymmetrical divisions. Um, the numbers you typed are actually the accents of the patterns. They are uh, highlighted uh, beats on the 16th division. So uh, the, the application works uh, in a way that if you type a wrong number and your uh, numbers are wrong, uh, the music will not play. So you can play music only if your uh, calculations are proper and you can uh, use any kind of numbers between the range. So let's see and let's hear how does it sound if I use uh, one hundred percent symmetrical division. Yeah, it's very, very balanced, but it's a little bit boring because you can hear all the periodic sound. Okay, uh, if I break this symmetry and let's say I put a one, and I can put a seven. Yeah, it's, it becomes much more interesting. Okay, I change it to three and I add this one to five. So this is the mathematical part of the uh, task and here comes the creative uh, part, which is sound design. Uh, all, all the rhythms, all the, all the sounds can be displayed here and you can change the parameters of the sound. It's a little bit, let's make it a little bit more sharp. Let's see that one. You, you don't need uh, musical knowledge of this. It's, it's pure experimenting. I just putting the sliders from the left to the one. Okay, see that one. 
let's make it a bit more soft and a bit lower. So I can have an overtone now. That's very good. Let's change that one. And how does it sound? Mm -hmm. Okay. Change that one. And I, and I can also change the tempo. Or make it slower. So I have plenty of options to, to make it more unique. Okay, that's about rhythms. And I, I can have another one, another application developed in 2000, 2019, I think. Yeah, that was my first uh, application, which is about musical sequences. A sequence is more or less an exact repetition of a passage at a higher or lower level of pitch. It is a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. So now uh, you are going to see a puzzle. Step one, recognize the pattern in this musical sequence. Okay, so now you have to discover something. One, eight, four, 11, a lot of numbers and if you if you watch it enough time you will discover that there is a four division in that so there is one two three yes one two three and uh, let's see numbers are okay let's say four 11, these are the A, B, C, D, the, the missing numbers. Seven and 40. Yes, okay. I completed the puzzle and now I can hear it back. Congratulations, you have successfully completed the first exercise. Now let's create your first musical sequence. Step one, choose a number between 16 and 99. Step two, type it into the first empty rectangle. Okay, let's say 31. I don't know what, does, no, what this number means. I just typed it. Okay, step three, choose other numbers between 16 and 99. Okay, what if I choose, let's say 41. Okay, you don't have to follow special rules. Use any numbers within this range. Okay. And another one, let's say 53 and 27. There are no connections between numbers. At least I, I chose it randomly. Okay, step four. Now you can listen to what you have created. Feel free to experiment with other numbers. Change the con content of these boxes if you want. Just as I mentioned in the previous uh, application, I have no idea what I'm doing now. I'm just change it. I just change it, let's say 30 to, maybe it will sound better because I found, so the first thing I discovered that the, the higher the number, the higher the frequency is. Okay, let's say 53 is too high for me. Okay, it doesn't sound much better. So now it's time to use some kind of mathematics. So, what if I apply this regular increment that I applied previously? Okay, uh, let's say the increment will be three. Oh. Okay. Okay. 
that sounds much better, much uh, more balanced. So I, I can I can do it in a reversed way, like starting from a uh, higher sound. Uh, okay, let's let's increase uh, the increment to four. Okay, I think I miscalculated something. Okay, okay maybe it's a bug, sorry. Uh, I did it. I, I programmed it in 2019. Okay, so that was a bug, and you don't need to use a regular increment like in the previous application. You can do any kind of numbers. I just wanted to to present that if you use some kind of mathematics, the sound will be much more uh, harmonic. So uh, let's say. I use random numbers. Okay, the next step uh, that uh, here comes a second row of the sequence. It's time to create a second element of your sequence. Choose a new starting number between 16 and 99. There's only one rule. It's very important. The difference between the numbers of the second group must be the same as the difference between the numbers of the first group. If the math is accurate, music starts to play. So if I add five to 25, it will be 30. If I add five to 47, that will be 52. If I add five to 43, that will be 48, 47, 62. Okay, I think I could, I could add it. Okay, stop numbers, start. Is that not supposed to be 68? Yes, yeah. 68. Okay, sorry. Uh, 68, correct. 68, sorry. Yeah, that works now. Okay, I have the second row of the sequence. You can hear a kind of transposition. The sequence is repeated at a higher level. Okay, uh, now I can create a third row. Seven. Okay, thank you. Two, three. Forty-two. 73. Now you can hear the third row of the sequence. Now you can see a kind of uh, control panel and you can start experimenting with the waveform. Filter attack. This is the creative part of the, the application. It's not about mathematics. It's just
Okay, that's all. A very straightforward connection between music and, and mathematics. Um, it, it helps uh, practicing mental math and it is a gateway between mathematics, music and acoustics. So it's an introduction to acoustics, actually. How, how uh, bass frequency and overtones are connected. Uh, it's it's a it's a uh, very important thing in music that uh, the overtones have harmonics which are uh, in, uh, integers uh, integers uh, on the bass frequency and you can demonstrate it and you can try it using these applications. Okay, so it can be implemented during a, a music uh, class or or during a mathematics class or, a, or an inter interdisciplinary classroom, uh, the only requirement is to have at least a mobile phone. It's a browser application. Uh, it can be run either or under Chrome or Safari or any kind of browsers. The only requirement is to have uh, a bit stronger processor in your mobile phone because the synthesis is real time. So these are not sound samples. Uh, these these are algorithms that synthesize uh, the sound. It's a very advanced technology. And uh, as uh, I, I hopefully you could hear that this, uh, the quality of the sound is very good. So there is no reduction in high frequencies like in a typical uh, sample based browser synthesizer. So high, high frequencies are beautiful and it does not require uh, desktop applications. So the, the reason why I designed it for browsers is to be available uh, through a website. So it, it doesn't require an um, administrator to allow in a school to download an application. Just go to the math classroom or an IT classroom and uh, turn on the computer and go to the website and do the mathematics and music with that. Okay, I hope uh, you could enjoy that. If you have any questions, Feel free to ask. I guess you have two questions, Lajos, mm -hmm. from uh, from Said Fahri Asagaf and also from Arnold. Okay, what if so we use did... the first few digits of pi three fourteen uh, three three fourteen fifteen? Okay, um, the range of it it does. Uh, there is a limit uh, of using numbers because three in Hertz is very low. is a very low frequency, so you cannot uh, you cannot recognize it as a musical sound. Three in hertz sounds ta 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 ta. It means three impulsion per uh, second. So uh, fourteen sounds. So it's it's not a musical sound. We we have to have at least thirty hertz to 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 be recognized as a musical sound. Thirty hertz is the the lowest uh, sound in a in a piano or in an organ, so that is the the lower limit. Okay, I hope it was uh, satisfying this answer. Okay, anyone else? Okay, you, you can type your uh, questions to the box later. Or you can you can write to me directly if you uh, have questions further. Okay, so I will I, I see it. Okay, you may try 31, 41, 30. I'm going to uh, send you the the title of the website and you can try it. You, you okay? I think it, it would be the best if I, I send the link. Okay. Uh, let's see the next presenter now. Uh, Barbara Jasbeck, Erie and uh, Interactive Sculpture. Uh, Barbara, are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to this breakout room. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen first. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna talk about a bit different project and I hope I inspire someone with some crazy ideas. 
Um, so first I'm gonna explain a bit who I am. I'm Barbara Asbet. I'm an intermediate artist from Slovenia, from Trbole. And before I did uh, my bachelor degree in media and arts in Finland, in Tampere University of Applied Sciences. And now for the past year, I've been working and living in Linz. I am a master's student at Interface Cultures, uh, where we deal a lot with interactive art, art and science, trying to rethink um, how to shape our society and future better through technology. And I work mainly with 360 degree videos. And now since I'm in Linz, I work a lot with different interfaces, all technology and how to hack all technology, et cetera, et cetera. And I also want to point out that I work uh, in my hometown for Speculum Artium, which is the art and science festival that's been running for 13 years. We had some big names there from Hiroshi Shiguro uh, to Stellar, Bill Viola, Victoria Vesna, and so on. And as part of the team, I work there with curating a video festival, Digital Big Screen, which for the past few years, we're trying to uh, bring the new technology forward that we don't only watch uh, movies on the flat screen, but we can watch them through VR glasses. So we inspire people to submit 360 degree deals 360 degree video works um, and we also have prizes for the best one and now I'll dive into my project so uh, for the like now one year and a half I've been exploring uh, different ways how to hack all, te all technologies so in this project here in me I created an interactive sculpture out of uh, Furby dolls and this project was made for Ars Electronica Festival, especially for the exhibition that our master degree had there. Uh, it was called Interface Cult. And first I can a bit explain the backstory, what is a Furby, if someone doesn't know. Uh, it's one of the first uh, smart toys that was made in the 90s, late 90s. And children could interact with it, you could talk to it, feed it, play with it, and it was so called that it speaks like Furbish language and English language, and with more speaking to the toy, it was created this illusion that you can basically teach Furby how to speak English, but this was not true, it was just an illusion to kind of manipulate children to play more with it, that they would feel kind of proud that they learned this toy how to speak English, and then later on also the toy was banned because some conspiracy theories came that uh, these toys were used as spy toys that <laughs> people could listen with them in their homes but that was just a lie because at that time it didn't have yet this AI in there and it was not connected to Wi-Fi or anything so in general um, my whole inspiration with this project is how to inspire people of reusing all technologies um, because with um, new and new technologies that are invented and brought on the market, uh, there comes more technological waste. So I really try to kind of inspire people that sometimes you can buy a secondhand something and uh, with this DIY culture build a new project out of it. So this how also this whole research started with the Furbies and I was was very curious uh, when you open it up, what is the system inside? And uh, um, this kind of medias then are called zombie medias because you bring the media back to life in a different form. And I think it's very important yeah, to mention the new ways that's been with each new technology is coming. There's more toxic waste produced that um, is non-recyclable and stuff like that. So also a good thing to point out is that in a way it's very much easier to hack all technologies because they're not built like a black box. Because in this uh, new days, the newer technology is on purposely built like a black box that when you open it up, you can't 
reuse it or fix it because um, companies want that the, 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 your device kind of breaks in three years and you purchase more and more in that sense. Um, yeah, that's it. But uh, then I will a bit also talk about another project that I did. It's called Disappear. And in this project, I used an old keyboard and I um, dismantled it and made a new interface out of it. And this is a very nice course we had at our master's interface cultures and it's called post media practice, where each of us we learn or how to open a keyboard or a mouse and how to build a new interface out of it. So this pair, for example, is completely made out of an old keyboard. And then when you plug it into a computer, I wrote a um, custom program for it in processing that when you click each button, you appear on the screen and then you slowly disappear. So these are just some examples that I try to inspire people how to use old project and build something new. And then I just want to a bit dive again in eerie me. Uh, it's sometimes how I work, I just make a sketch and out of this sketch then how the realization came. And here I have some uh, pictures of the process. This is my Furby. When I was a kid, I got it in the early 2000s. And it's a kind of personal story with this project. I can just explain shortly that because when I was a kid, I broke my arm. And when I was in the hospital, my family bought me this Furby as a companion to not be lonely. So when I a few years ago discovered this toy at my attic, I was like, oh, what should I do with it? And then this whole project came that I want to create this kind of creature that it's a mutant between me and the Furby. And then later on, I purchased it on Wilhaben. More of them, these newer editions, uh, because they have LD screens as eyes. So I was really curious then, what can I do with them? And I hack them in a way that I replace the screens and I put inside small TFT screens with my own eyes on them. And this is then the final product that was made for Ars Electronica. And also I was very curious about uh, the materials. I did a small research also on bioplastics and how to make in a way your own plastics. So um, for this sculpture, I use some of the bioplastics I cook myself at home with combination with latex because I also a big fan in sort of uh, practical effects like the effects that they used in the horror movies or sci-fi movies from the 80s and 90s and a lot of green slime and etc. So um, actually then here yeah, when you approach this uh, sculpture you can interact with it. There are a few buttons here when you press them the sculpture wakes up because when you stop interacting with it it goes asleep. It's like a, a living being in a way. And uh, you can feed it, you can talk to it, you can sing with it, et cetera, et cetera. So here are some shots from the Ars Electronica uh, exhibition, Interface Cult. And then also there are some small screens around. You can explore the sculpture and see what's happening. And there's some light blinking, like a heartbeat, um, a detail where you can see to me and um, then also as part of this research I wanted to use AI so in this process I used all of my Facebook photos that I've been tagging to generate a sequence of images transitioning between my face and the Furby face uh, so these uh, things were playing on the small screens here and it was like morphing from my face to Furby. Um, and yeah, uh, that's it from ours. And then I also have some future plans for it because this is an ongoing research. Uh, and for each show, I try to create like a new version of Eerie Meme. Uh, that it always looks a bit different. And now uh, I've been accepted to do an exchange program in Yamas, Japan from April to June. I really hope I can go there and that COVID doesn't affect this. And there um, 
I want to dive a bit more into a sense um, of its appearance and what is uncanny, uh, because, because a lot of this kind of robotic artworks where they have some movements, they kind of uh, gave us this uncomfortable feeling. So I want to explore a bit more of that topic. And also I want to visit it, uh, flea markets and secondhand markets in Japan to see what kind of secondhand technology I can find there, what kind of toys they have that I can hack and uh, personalize them and make another version of Eerie Me and yeah, that's it. I can show also a short video of how the sculpture actually moves when you see it. It doesn't have sound, but it doesn't matter. You can just uh, see in the exhibition. And that's it from my presentation. Amazing, thank you very much. And, and congratulations for your, for your artworks. Uh, I have to uh, tell you that in Hungary, it's a, it's a very hot topic today to use old technology to create some uh, things. Uh, and uh, I, currently I'm in Budapest and we have regular exhibitions, sound art exhibitions, kinetic sound sculpture and uh, uh, this kind of uh, exhibitions as well. So you're very welcome to, to go to Hungary and exhibit your artworks. Uh, I, oh. I can send you some links if you are interested in. Yeah, things. that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Thank Any you. questions? You can type it into the message box. Oh, sorry, please don't forget to upload your presentation slides to the drive. Okay. Yeah. Okay, just one more question for you. Uh, have you heard about <clears throat> Arduino? The, the Ar software or the uh, component? The and the software. Uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we used it a lot in my studies. We learned how to code with it and use different microcontrollers. Yeah, so... Uh, in in our university, Arduino, we have a special course for Arduino and we create very similar things to university. So we love that stuff. It's, it's very good. It's although it's, it's not an old technology. So it's, yeah. it's quite uh, cutting edge, but you can combine it with some old stuff. Yeah, I combine, actually, I use the small uh, ESP32, which is a wire wireless microcontrollers mm -hmm. in the Furby to use uh, my eyes as a screen. So it's yeah. also a bit code made in Arduino <laughs> with a different microcontroller. Because it's sometimes hard to hack uh, exactly the old technology on its own. You always need some other microcontroller to mm -hmm. where you can add your own code to it. Yeah, yeah, very good. Any questions? OK. So if you don't have questions, uh, I would like to thank you for participating. I, I, I just have to check the schedule once again, but I think Barbara, you were the last presenter. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I have one question because my friend in the area, she's also from this university, was supposed to present the first one today in group two, but okay, she, she couldn't connect. And then uh, I asked if she could present after me, but I didn't get any confirmation. Okay. Okay. That. I don't know if she's here now or not. <laughs> I think she's not here. Oh, I, I'm going to check the, the names now, but I, I can't see her. Okay. Anyway, thank you for participating. Yeah. And if you thank want you. to, uh, you can go to other breakout rooms if you are interested in other projects now. Uh, can you can you do it alone or uh, Pastida? Yep. Can you please um, uh, help me to to redirect uh, participants to other rooms if they want? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you.
and I also stop the recording now and upload it to market.